Hello, North Church. I'm glad that you are joining us today. This is going to be an exciting day. I'm looking forward to this series continuing called Stories because every name has a story. Matter of fact, we're talking about real people making a real difference in the world. And today, today we've got a good one. Um, the atheist turned Christian Lee Strobel is former award-winning legal editor of the Chicago Tribune and best-selling author of over 20 books. His classic, The Case for Christ, is a perennial favorite uh, which details his conversion to Christianity. The book most recently became a movie which opened in over 1,100 theaters. For the past 25 years, his life's work has been to share the evidence that supports the truth and the claims of Christianity and to equip believers to share their faith with people they love and know. Lee is currently a teaching pastor at Church of the Woodlands in Houston, Texas, where he speaks multiple times a year and has recently joined the faculty at Houston Baptist University as professor of Christian thought. Lee and his wife, Leslie, have been married for over 40 years and have two children and four grandchildren. Today, will you welcome with me Lee Strobel. Thank you. Good to be with you. So your search into the claims of Christ yeah. okay, started with your wife's conversion in 1979. Yeah. Uh, can you describe that feeling when this unfolded in your life? Well, when she told me that she had come to faith in Christ, uh, the first word that went through my mind was divorce. I was going to walk out. Um, I thought that it was a crutch. I thought that it was make-believe, fairy tales, wishful thinking. I thought she was naive and gullible for buying into it. And uh, frankly, I, I had no interest in being married to someone who would pursue something I couldn't relate to and, and, and didn't understand and wasn't interested in. I was an atheist at the time, so I was denying the existence of God. And uh, so I was, I was literally going to walk out um, and almost did, but stuck around. And um, it was really a lot of the positive changes in her character and values over time that encouraged me to ultimately begin to check into the faith. Now, when you, when you talk about Leslie yeah. uh, in regards to that time, that had to have been challenging for her. Yes, very much so. Uh, there had been some ups and downs, valleys there. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, we did a book called uh, Surviving a Spiritual Mismatch. What do you do if your spouse is not a believer? Because it's a very difficult situation. Um, you know, she felt like she was very alone. Uh, she felt like she was going on this great journey of discovery, like as if you would go to Paris or Africa or these wonderful journeys, but she couldn't share it with me. She couldn't take me along. We couldn't talk about it. I wasn't interested. I would shut her down. Um, and, and then it would cause a lot of arguments. You know, if I woke up in the morning and she was reading the Bible, I'd get into an argument about why she was wasting her time. Um, so it, it is a very difficult situation for both parties in a situation like that. And that's, you know, the Bible says don't become unequally yoked. The Bible warns us that, um, you know, there's danger ahead if you have two different spiritual perspectives like that. Of course, we were married before this even took place. In, in, your, in your search uh, for the, uh, the claims of Christ, yeah. uh, when you began to dive into that, you began to read, you began to uh, do your research. Yeah. You also met with dozens of scholars. Yeah. Uh, what was one of the most convincing arguments or moments mm. uh, which begins to challenge you and uh, to maybe begin to lean toward becoming a believer? Well, I focused on the resurrection of Jesus because uh, even the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. In other words, that's the linchpin of the Christian faith. So I, th I thought if I could disprove the resurrection, then certainly uh, the whole faith would come tumbling down. I could rescue my wife from this cult that she was involved in, and I could go back to our marriage the way it was. Well, it um, didn't quite work out that way. Uh, and one of the reasons is that I thought that the resurrection was a legend. And I know it took time for legend to develop in the ancient world. In fact, A.N. Sherwin White, the great Oxford scholar, uh, ancient historian, said the passage of two generations of time was not even enough in that era for legend to grow up and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. So I thought, you know, 100, 150, 200 years after Jesus, these legends began to develop, and that's where the idea of the resurrection came from. Well, one of the key bits of evidence that I found persuasive and, and influential uh, came from Dr. Gary Habermas, who's a resurrection scholar. And he pointed out that we have a, 
um, a, a, a report of the resurrection in the form of an ancient creed of the church. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3. This says that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again on the third day, and then it mentions the specific names of eyewitnesses, including opponents and skeptics and, and, a, and 500 people at once to whom he appeared. Well, what's important about that creed is how immediately it developed after the death of Jesus. Uh, James D.G. Dunn, one of the greatest scholars in this area, uh, has said that this creed can be dated back to within months of the death of Jesus. Well, that's far too quickly uh, to be a legend or, or mythology. And uh, as a, someone trained in journalism and law, I realized that the immediacy of that report is very influential in telling me whether or not it was uh, reliable. Love it. You know, I, when it comes to the claims of Christ and his deity, yeah. there's some of those things that, well, it's the virgin birth, really? I mean, yeah. who, who knows? Yeah. Uh, the miracles, well, other people have done miracles yeah. and maybe sleight of hand, whatever. But when it comes to that resurrection, yeah. I, you're... you're being able to focus in on that one thing, which was so important, yeah. which is the crux because it validates everything else. It does. And, you know, Jesus claimed to be the son of God. Um, and yet the resurrection was that which kind of validated that for us and, and said, you know, anybody can claim to be the son of God. You could, I could, anybody could. But if Jesus claimed to be the son of God, died, and then three days later rose from the dead, that's pretty good evidence he's telling yes. the truth. <laughs> yes, yes. So in the book, the Case for Christ, um, and the movie, they seem to take different paths. Yeah. Uh, one focuses on the logical arguments uh, that was the foundation of your conversion, uh, while the other focuses more on the story behind the book. Yeah. Okay? In fact, it mainly seems to focus on a husband and wife story. Yeah. Uh, why did you decide to tell, or why did they decide to tell the story this way? Well, um, because that is the story. And, you know, humans don't exist in vacuums. And uh, this was a dynamic situation with relationships and friendships and a marriage involved, children involved, and so forth. So um, we wanted to tell the entire story and um, kind of unfold it uh, as best we could. Of course, in movies, there's some time shifting involved and there's some composite characters and so forth. But as best we could, we wanted to tell the story with all the relational dynamics, um, mainly because um, people can relate to that. And, and um, you know, it's not as, you know, we could do a documentary and just do the evidence, and which we did. We did a documentary based on the book in 2004 and uh, that's one way to approach it, but we wanted to do a film that would reach out to non-believers, to people who don't go to church, to people who won't read a book, uh, who are spiritually confused or curious, uh, so that they would kind of get involved with the story and through the story see some of the evidence that I found convincing. Mm, so good. You, you know, in the movie, you're portrayed as a hot-tempered, drinking um, individual. Yeah. Is this true? Uh, and then what happened? How did your life change from this hot-tempered drinking person mm. to who you are today? Yeah, I mean, the movie's embarrassing on a lot of levels because it shows my life before I was a Christian, and I, am I, I'm not proud of my behavior uh, in that era of my life. I was successful in my career um, at the Chicago Tribune. I was writing books. I was doing television things. I was um, on the front page of the Tribune several days a week. So I was successful, but behind the scenes, what people didn't see was me literally drunk in the snow in an alley on Saturday night. So, uh, you know, I, would, uh, I was a heavy drinker. I was uh, hot-tempered, as you say. I was a narcissist. I was self-absorbed, uh, self-destructive in many ways, um, angry in many ways. Uh, I mean, that was my life. That was who I was. And, um, uh, you know, after I came to faith in Christ, um, by his grace, uh, I stopped drinking like that. And I, I say that hesitantly a bit because there are people who come to faith who have a drinking issue in their life. And it's a struggle for a long time. And I understand that. And, and so um, in my case, it was an instantaneous uh, healing of that desire to drink. And... Um, um, you know, my values, my character, my morality, my worldview, my philosophy, my priorities, my relationships, my marriage, my parenting. I mean, all those things over time um, began to change for the good after I came to faith, after the Holy Spirit took up residence in me, uh, after God began to reorient uh, my desires and, and, and my, uh, my heart and my soul. In a recent article, uh, you mentioned that uh, some of the scenes really hit home for you in the movie. 
Yeah. Uh, you say, quote, uh, there are some scenes that we get emotional about because it ripped, it was ripped from our lives. Yeah. Like a transcript. One in particular was a scene in the car where you tell your wife that you don't think you can re remain married to her while she remains a Christian. Can you describe this scene for us and the feelings behind that? Yeah, I mean, some, several of the scenes like that one are ones that are just uh, almost verbatim from what occurred. And, you know, I, I was uh, very angry toward her faith for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, I felt like I was, um, she was cheating on me with Jesus. All of a sudden, there was another man in our marriage who she looked up to, she worshipped, she loved. Well, where does that leave me? And, and, and I thought I was the one to provide that kind of emotional support. Oh. So as weird as that feels, I felt like, sure. or it sounds, uh, I felt like she was cheating on me with Jesus. Uh, I felt like um, uh, she was being pulled into a Christian subculture where I wasn't welcome as an atheist. Um, I felt like she was judging me for my lifestyle, even though she really wasn't. But I, I, it, it's as if she was holding a mirror up to me. And the more she lived a life of holiness, the more she lived a life of purity and, 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 and um, commitment to God, it was as if she was holding up a mirror, and in contrast to that, I was seeing my own life and how it was corroded by sin and immorality, and I didn't like that. It made me mad, made me angry. I thought I like to see myself as a great guy, but I was seeing the, the real me in contrast to her. Uh, that made me angry. So we had all these emotional dynamics going on in the midst of this. She want, How we raised our children, how we are going to spend our money, those were all in conflict now. Um, so there were a lot of those kind of dynamics going on and, and um, uh, you know, scenes like that one in the car where I basically said, look, I'm not going to be doing this five years from now. I'm not going to be doing this two years from now. Um, if you continue down this road, count me out. Uh, you know, as embarrassing as it is to talk about that and confess that, that's the kind of attitude I had. In the movie, your character is challenged by the idea of a... Um a father wound. Yeah. So talk to us about um, the relationship maybe. Um, your father played uh, with your struggle. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the journey mm. of being able to understand a heavenly father who loves you. Well, it's interesting that Paul Vitz, who is a psychologist at New York University, did a study a number of years ago in which he looked at the lives of all the famous atheists through history. Camus, Sartre, Nietzsche, Freud, Voltaire, Wells, Feuerbach, uh, O'Hare, you just go down the line. Every single one of them had a father who either, either abandoned their family when they were young or who died when they were young or with whom they had a very difficult relationship. And the implication mm. is, and Freud commented on this, the implication is that if your earthly father has disappointed you or hurt you in some way, you don't want to get to know a heavenly father because you think he's going to be worse. So in my own case, I had a very difficult relationship with my dad. And actually, one scene was cut from the movie, and I'm kind of glad it was because it was such a tender, uh, difficult uh, moment in my life. I, I would hate to relive it every time I saw the movie. But um, I did some things behind my dad's back, and, and he caught me. And uh, on the eve of my high school graduation, we had a big blowout argument, and he looked at me and said, I don't have enough love for you to fill my little finger. Um, so we had a, a real broken relationship. And uh, was that a factor in me walking down the path toward atheism? I think it probably was. You know, often people become atheists because of intellectual objections, but often there are emotional or psychological reasons, um, reasons of the will, because you prefer the sinful life that, you, uh, that you're enjoying, as I did, enjoy the life that I was leading and so forth. So a lot of reasons people walk down that path. But I think one of them in my case was this broken relationship with my father, which... Um, uh, you know, made me not want to know a heavenly father and to deny his existence. Now, as the film portrays, uh, which is true, uh, at my dad's funeral, I, I came to see that there was another side, that he did love me and, and that he did care about me and that he did, was proud of me, uh, which I wasn't aware of during his life. Uh, what we didn't show in the movie was I had asked all the people at the funeral home to leave the room, and I stood in front of my dad in his casket and I said, first of all, I'm sorry, um, because I was sorry for how I contributed to our broken relationship. And then I said, I forgive you um, for the role that he played in our relationship. And I, I wish those were things I had said during his life, um, but they weren't. And, and um, you know, I hope people who 
have a kind of broken relationship or think through, you know, I'd rather have that conversation in this world than wait until I'm looking at someone in a casket. I heard you uh, mention uh, a situation or a, that happened during the movie while it was being filmed uh, with a the person who actually played your yeah. father. Yeah. And could you kind of a talk about yeah. that a little bit and what that meant to you. Yeah, his name is Robert Forster. He's a uh, he's one of those actors when you see his face, you say, oh yeah, I've seen him in a million things. He's yeah. been in 130 movies, Academy Award nominee. So a veteran character actor playing my father. And so we went to the set uh, where he, he was filming. I had not met him yet. Uh, so they were filming and then they called cut and they took a break. Well, he walked over to me um, and I was standing next to Leslie and he stayed in character as my dad. So he walks up to me in character as my father and he reaches out and puts his hand on my shoulder and he looks me in the eye and he says, Lee, I'm sorry. And um, that was a very, um, um, I mean, those are the words I wish I'd heard from my dad uh, during his life uh, and didn't. And the fact that he would have the, the, uh, the sensitivity to um, seize that opportunity to have a healing moment with me in the role of my dad, I thought was very kind of him, and, and it made a big impact on me. In the movie, um, it, it's really emphasized the power of relationships. Yeah. Uh, not just these great arguments and revelation in regards to proving somebody wrong, but the, the story of love through relationships. Yeah. Talk to us about how relationships key relationships maybe impacted you mm. in regards to your journey to faith? Yeah, there were there's so many uh, relationships that had an impact on me uh, along that pathway, some of which are portrayed in the movie and some of which aren't. Um, for instance, um, the woman in the movie, uh, Alfie, who uh, was the mentor to Leslie uh, in real life, Linda, uh, had a husband who I got to know and was very impressed by his lifestyle as a follower of Jesus. Very authentic, very honest, very sincere. Um, that had an impact on me. Um, uh, when my daughter was born, she almost died, and she was in a neonatal intensive care unit for quite a while. Uh, and a guy who was a Christian, who I knew from my past, who I had been very abusive toward in our relationship, reached out to me. And, and, and prayed for uh, our family and for my daughter, even though I didn't believe in God at the time, I, I really appreciated that. And was very kind in um, sitting next to me during that very difficult and emotional era of our life and reaching out to me. That had an impact on me. I remember a street gang leader in Chicago who shot a guy in the back and fled the state, became a Christian, came and turned himself in. to his, They weren't looking for him, but he felt it's the right thing to do. And I was a reporter at the Chicago Tribune, and I saw him come into court and say, look, I did it. I shot him. I meant to kill him. I'm guilty. Um, I'm a Christian now. I regret it, but I need to pay my price to society. And um, so I covered that case and, and, said, and the judge let him go um, uh, because of his changed life. And he looked at me and he said, Lee, uh, what God did was show me grace. And I know you're an atheist, but you know what? If you let him, God will show you grace too. So here I had a former street gang leader who influenced me. So I had a lot of people in my life. Number one was my wife, of course, who I saw her grow in her faith and in her commitment to Christ, and that was very influential. But there are often these other relationships that play a role in us coming to Jesus. You know, in your most recent um, book, The Case for Grace, yeah. Um, it's shaped by an event or of illness, mm -hmm. sickness that yeah. you almost you almost died. Yeah. Could you talk to us a little bit about how that maybe shaped your thinking of God and mm. your relationship with Him? Yeah, I had a hyponatremia, which is a severe drop in blood sodium, um, which causes initially mental confusion, hallucinations, um, seizures, coma, and death. Uh, I was having hallucinations. Those don't sound good. That was bad. <laughs> it was a bad, bad scene. I was having hallucinations. I was having mental confusion, and my wife found me unconscious. Uh, hospital, uh, the ambulance took me to the hospital. When I woke up in the emergency room, the doctor said, you're one step away from a coma, two steps away from dying. So I was really on the edge there of, of dying. Uh, my blood sodium had dropped to 112, which any physician will know that you can't live at that 
level, that you're going to die. What happens is your brain cells uh, begin to take in water uh, because of the lack of sodium. And so your brain expands while your skull is constricted space. And so your brain is expanding. So it's a very challenging situation. Um, and my son, in the midst of that, who is a PhD in theology, uh, came to me and said, Dad, I, I know you're confused. I know you're um, struggling. And I said, I am. And, and um, uh, I, I felt like I was distant from God in the midst of this. I, 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 didn't, I couldn't draw close to God. And he, he led me in a prayer experience. It took about half an hour where I emptied all of who I was before God and just walked through and said, God, I'm not a father, I'm not a grandfather, I'm not an author, I'm not a husband, I'm not um, financially successful, I'm not a Christian celebrity, I'm not, I just stripped away everything for half an hour, Bram, I'm not these things, until all it was left was me as a redeemed son of God standing with my heavenly father. Okay. And so at good. that moment, reconnecting on a very deep level. Uh, that, that was profound to me. And I look back on what was a very difficult year, and I say, thank you, God, for taking me through that struggle and that difficulty and near-death experience because the result was my connection with God um, was um, you know, stronger, made stronger through that experience so that even today um, I still go through that kind of exercise and try to come before God uh, and strip away all the worldly things. I'm, I'm not okay. my bank account. I'm not my, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a redeemed son of the Most High and, and relate to him uh, as my Heavenly Father. That's good. What about those individuals who are struggling and they're saying, if, if there was a good God, why the evil, why the suffering, mm. why the pain in the world today? Yeah. And they are just struggling with that. Uh, and, and um, yeah, and it's an age old. It's been around for years. Sure. I've, I've heard it all my life. But what what do you say to them? You know, um, it's it's easy to say God can bring good out of evil and good out of suffering. I was just mentioned about my own sickness and illness. How God brought good out of that. But when you think of the fact that God took the worst thing that ever happened in the history of the universe, which is the death of the Son of God on the cross, the worst thing that could ever happen. And he turned it into the best thing that could ever happen, which is the opening of heaven to all who follow him. So that means he can take whatever struggles that we are going through. And Romans 8.28 says, if we're faithful to him, if we follow him, uh, he will cause good to emerge in this world or the next world. However it is, he is going to be faithful to that promise. But what I want to say is, um, you know, it's interesting in professional debates between atheists and Christians, they don't generally bring up the pain of suffering issue that much anymore. And the reason is Christians have a good answer for it. And the answer is that God has existed from eternity past in a relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in this Godhead, this perfect of love relationship. And so when God decided to create humankind, he wanted us to be able to experience the greatest value in the universe, which is love. Well, in order to do that, he had to give us free will because real love involves a choice to love or not to love. I can't force you to love me. Um, And so we have to have free choice. Well, we were given free choice, and what did we do with it? We turned our back on God. We um, have have, uh, not fed the hungry. We've we've, um, trashed relationships. We've sinned. And and this has created um, um, suffering in in our world. Um, But it's, it's disingenuous for me to say, You know, with this hand, I can take food and feed someone who's hungry, or I can take a gun and shoot you. And if I take a gun, then to blame God for the presence of evil and suffering in the world, it's a little disingenuous. Um, I've seen the enemy, and the enemy is us, you know. Um, So, um, you know, that's how evil and suffering is entered into the world. Did God create it? No. Did he give us free will that allowed us to go down that path? Yes, he did. Will he and can he cause good to emerge from it? Yes, he will. Will he ultimately bring justice and judge evil and, and so forth? Yes, he will. But again, it's a little disingenuous to, uh, for instance, take a novel and, and read one third of the novel and then throw it down and say, what a crummy book. He didn't bring the plot together. He didn't resolve the plot. Well, you only read a third of the book. You know, uh, God will resolve this issue. Evil will be 
um, dealt with ultimately by God. Um, we got to get to the end of the book, and we're not there yet. So, so Lee, <clears throat> um, talk to me a little bit about Christianity and science. Mm. And can those two be reconciled? Yeah, absolutely. Christianity and science are not in conflict. Um, now, Christianity and naturalism are. Uh, naturalism says that all there is in this world is that which we can see and touch, the physical world. Well, uh, first of all, that's a self-refuting statement. Um, but, but second of all, uh, that is saying in advance, God does not exist. All that exists is, well, of course, there's going to be conflict with um, Christianity if you come to the conclusion at the outset that God does not exist. But science itself um, does not point away from God. Science points toward God. In fact, um, you know, when I investigated um, evidence for Jesus and, and coming to faith in Christ, I didn't just look at the resurrection, I also looked at science. And what I found is that there's been a series of discoveries over the last 50 years in cosmology, physics, biochemistry, genetics, and human consciousness that point powerfully and persuasively toward the existence of a creator who just happens to look a lot like the God of the Bible. So, you know, science, when done right, when you don't rule out God at the beginning, but you leave an open mind, um, the evidence of science, I think, points powerfully and persuasively toward the truth of the Christian faith. Mm. That is really good. I, I mean, I, there's going to be people listening to this conversation that are going to be um, encouraged, mm. uh, challenged, strengthened, built up. But let me ask you this. In regards to you, you sound very confident. You sound like you have all the answers. Uh, but do you struggle in your faith uh, to this day? I, mean, I know one time you did. Yeah. But do you still struggle in your faith? And if so, how do you handle those struggles? Yeah. It, you know, I, I, I don't have doubts that, that threaten my soul. Uh, do I have questions? Yes, of course. I'm, I'm going to have my hand raised in heaven and ask Jesus, what about this and what about that? Um, um, so, yes, there are questions that come up. Um, but... I always go back to the evidence, ultimately. And the evidence, as I say, cosmology, physics, biochemistry, genetics, human consciousness, that give me confidence that there is a creator. Uh, the evidence of the resurrection, that gives me confidence that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, but he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. I go back to that evidence to remind myself that my faith in Christ has a solid foundation uh, that is built not on wishful thinking, not on make-believe, not on legends, not on mythology, but on a solid foundation of scientific and historical truth. And, and so when I have a question or a doubt that comes up, I go back to that to remind myself of that. And then I like to seek out um, uh, uh, you know, godly and, and, and brilliant people uh, who can shed some light on those things. And, and there's some Good. incredible resources these days to be able to do that. I did a book called The Case for Faith, where I went out and I interviewed uh, great scholars on the top eight objections to Christianity. And uh, that was a boost to my faith, to be able to go out and, and to hear them answer questions like, why does a loving God allow pain and suffering? Why would a loving God send people to hell? Um, uh, how can Jesus be the only way to God? And these, these, these difficult questions of faith. So, um, you know, I, I think we have to go back. What is the foundation of our faith? It's not our feelings. Uh, it is the factual foundation of who God is and who Jesus is. Difficult times. Um, are going to come to all of us. Yeah. So uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, your difficult times as an atheist, mm. how you handled them <laughs> versus now as a follower of Christ. Oh, man, there's uh, no in comparison. In the difficult times. Yeah, there's no comparison. I'm mean, as an atheist. Um, you are ultimately on your own. You're, you're unanchored from any real help. Uh, people can sympathize with you, but if you were diagnosed with a terminal illness uh, or you're diagnosed with something or whatever, you, they're not going to be able to really ultimately um, bring you uh, comfort beyond just trying to make you feel good in the moment. Um, so, you know, atheism is ultimately a bankrupt philosophy that offers no hope. And you know what? I'm willing to believe it if it were true. In other words, yes, it's a bleak picture. There is no hope uh, ultimately. When you die, that is it. Um, that's a bleak picture. I'm willing, though, to believe it if it is true because I don't want to put my trust in something that is false. The good news is it's not true. There is hope. Jesus is real. He brings comfort not only in a way of a friend sitting next to you and sympathizing as a good friend might, but 
um, because when you come to faith, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Uh, God is in you in a way that, that allows you to access his, his peace, his encouragement, um, more than just a friend can impart to you. So, um, and I see him doing things in this world and in my life that I can only explain as divine interventions, as miracles. My next book that I'm writing, I'm just in the middle of this, is called The Case for Miracles because I see God doing things in our lives that we can only explain as a supernatural work of God. Um, I, I, you know, so as a Christian, I have that in my life. Um, and, and I have the hope of eternity. And, um, um, and I have a purpose in life that goes beyond eating and, and sleeping and, and just doing a job. Uh, but God's given me a, a role to play in telling others this good news that brings hope and eternal life and so. So, uh, you know, it's a night and day uh, experience. I would, I would uh, never trade uh, the richness and the robustness and the joy and the adventure of being a follower of Jesus mm. with what had been a very bleak uh, um, uh, existence as an atheist. Mm. So Lee, what does Jesus mean to you? In your own words, tell us about what Jesus really means to you. Well, uh, he is the unique son of God, and that means there is no other. Uh, that he is the only path um, to restore relationship with God through his suffering and death. He offers forgiveness as a gift of his grace. And when we receive that, we come into a relationship with him. The Holy Spirit indwells us. Um, we have hope of eternity. We have the guidance of scripture and of God's wisdom in our life. Uh, we feel him guiding us and leading us through life. Um, um, we have a source of comfort. Um, we have a source of joy, of peace. Uh, he brings, you know, one of the things that I think is fascinating because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, because of uh, the Holy Spirit's work in us, Galatians says we can experience more and more over time the very nine things that all of us want in life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I mean, those are the very nine things that most of us are looking for in life. And God says, I will manifest those things, those qualities in your life uh, over time as you faithfully follow me. So, um, you know, and, and now to see not only God changing my life and not only changing my uh, children's life, but now my grandchildren. And to see my little granddaughter... Yes. Uh, who went on her first missions trip at age 10, uh, where they slept in sleeping bags in a church basement in a very poverty-stricken community and reached out and did evangelism with the children in the community. And at age 10, uh, she led her first um, uh, little girl uh, to faith in Jesus Christ. And so I, I look at you know, God saying, I'm not going to allow you to pass a broken baton like in a race, you know, Good. to a next generation. It's going to be, a, 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 you know, a baton that is, is solid and so forth. And so to see now this next generation finding faith in God, finding purpose, finding hope, finding encouragement, finding a reason to live and, and, and an encouragement to know that um, she's adopted as God's child forever uh, and watching that play out. Uh, in the next generations, uh, you know, that's what Jesus means to me. He means a transformed life in this world and then confidence of a relationship with him forever in heaven. Lee, would you mind wrapping us up, by maybe giving a, giving a call to Christ? Sure. And then you give that call to Christ, then wrap us up in prayer. Yeah. Uh, for all of those who may be choosing to follow Jesus. Yeah, I'd, be gl I, I'd love to. You know, uh, the verse that uh, uh, really was pivotal in me coming to faith, after I did all this research and came to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, I realized that's not enough just to understand that. Um, John 1, 12, and you referenced this earlier, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And that forms an equation of what it means to become a child of God. Believe plus receive equals become. So if you believe as best you can that Jesus is the unique son of God, um, 
yes, you may have questions. That's okay. We all have questions about one thing or the other. But one thing you can know with confidence is Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed it up by returning from the dead. So if you believe as best you can that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that's great. But then that verse says there's another step, and that's receiving him. Receiving this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that he purchased on the cross when he died as your substitute to pay for all of your sin. And when you receive this free gift of his grace, this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life, then you become a child of God. Well, you can do that. You can do it right now. So let's just say, you know, if you believe as best you can and you want to take that step to receive, then in your heart, and you don't even have to close your eyes, you don't even have to say a word, just in your heart, God will hear you in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, as best I can, I do believe that you are the Son of God. And right now, I confess the obvious, which is that I am a sinner. I have I've not lived the perfect life, far from it. And I confess that, and I want to turn from that. And right now, I want to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you purchased for me on the cross. Thank you for loving me so much that you endured the torture of the cross so that we could be reconciled in this world and in the world to come. Help me, Lord Jesus, to live the kind of life that you want me to live because from this moment on, I am yours. Now, Father, we know that uh, from your word that anyone who takes that step, who prays in repentance and faith to receive your free gift of grace has become your child. And we celebrate those that even in this moment have taken that step. We thank you for this opportunity you've given us to proclaim your message of hope and grace. And we pray for those who are still on the journey, who aren't ready yet, that, God, you would use Uh, the books or whatever resources the church to bring them your message of hope and grace so that someday we can celebrate their rebirth as well. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to be on this great journey of faith, to grow in our relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Lee Strobel, thank you so very much. Hey, I've enjoyed it. It has been a pleasure. My pleasure. An honor. Thank you. Thank you.